Good afternoon. Uh, I'm so sorry we've had some technical difficulties, but I think we're mainly there. Uh, my name is Steve Burns, and I'm the president of the Untermeyer Gardens Conservancy. And I'm here to welcome Emma Clark to speak at our annual winter lecture. Last year, our lecture took place on March 9th, only days before the onset of the worldwide COVID lockdown. And so much has since changed. One benefit of the coronavirus, and one of the few benefits of the coronavirus, has been to enable us to reach around the world to find speakers. And today we are lucky that Emma has interrupted her dinner hour in England to speak to us today, or perhaps her cocktail hour. Most of you know that Untermar Gardens has the finest Persian garden in the Western Hemisphere, and that we delight in exploring the meanings and nuances of its design. Emma Clark first came to my attention through her book entitled The Art of the Islamic Garden. I then read her article entitled Underneath Which Rivers Flow, and I knew that here was someone with a rare and profoundly spiritual knowledge of Persian gardens past and present. I then learned that she designed the Persian garden at Highgrove, the country house of Prince Charles. On top of that, she herself converted to Islam 30 years ago through exposure to Sufism, the inner dimension of Islam. Often converts know more about a religion than those born to it, so I concluded that we must ask her to address us as a believer, a scholar, and a garden designer. What speaks to me most profoundly about a Persian garden is its all-embracing message of the Garden of Eden, which is a shared concept of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I very much admire the statement of Prince Charles that when he is king, he wants to be the defender of faith not the defender of the faith. In a world in which Islam is so vilified, we have no further to look than at a Persian garden to begin to grasp the beauty of the Islamic tradition. With all of this said, I know that you will join me in welcoming Emma Clark. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and good evening for me. Um, Steve, that was a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Um, this is going to be a strange talk. You will just hear my voice, but that's fine um, because you can see, I hope that you can see the slides properly. Um, one thing that um, Steve said several times, he referred to these gardens as Persian gardens. Um, I'd like to say they are they are not only Persian gardens, <laughs> because um, in a sense, there is a unity underneath all of Islamic art and architecture. So there are Persian, that we usually call them Islamic gardens. And then of course, they're manifested in different ways across the Islamic world. Of course, if you're from Persia or Iran, they tend to claim they are all Persian gardens. <laughs> and there's some case for this, but not entirely. In any case, um, as we say in Islam, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, this is like the prayer of consecration to begin anything. And this is to begin my talk. It's in the name of the God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. And I'd also say, I'd like to say assalamu alaikum, which is peace be upon you. So, and also thank you to Jessica Norman, um, also of Antimai Gardens, who's done tremendous work getting this technical hitch going. So it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. My presentation this afternoon has a somewhat long title, The Islamic Garden as Sacred Art and as an Opportunity for Bridge Building Between Cultures. This is due to my desire to explain the essential universality of the Islamic Garden, to show that it is not something alien, but on the contrary is an art form which may speak to everyone and may be created in many parts of the world without looking out of place. This is providing certain criteria are followed, which we will look at later. This garden indeed is in Persia or Iran. This is Daulatabad. It's a beautiful, um, the, with these wonderful wind catcher, wind catcher at the end. Sorry. 
in my view, the best way to convey this universality initially is to look at the Islamic garden as a form of sacred art, what this means and how it may help us in bridge building between cultures. Sacred art is essentially universal and timeless, but is manifested in a multitude of ways in different civilizations across the globe. In order to respect and value the sacred art of other civilizations, often very different from our own, we need keys to unlock the door to understanding, as it were. Now, I have a, a rather long quote, but it's a very useful one from Prince Razi bin Muhammad of Jordan, who said several years ago, sacred art is to do with beauty, and beauty is a universal language. Beauty can break down barriers better than interfaith dialogue. The revival of traditional Islamic art has been the best messenger and the best barrier breaker between Islam and the West. Because people come and they say, this is beautiful. It's not beautiful because it's Islamic. It's just beautiful. It's universal. And so people come away from traditional Islamic art with a positive, a positive image of the Islamic civilization and even a love for Islamic civilization. That's the end, end of the quotation. Now, there's no doubt that the garden in Islam is one of the finest, if less well-known examples of this civilization's art. Through the actual experience of being in an Islamic garden, wherever it may be in the world, walking amongst the trees and flower beds, sitting by a fountain or playing with children, it is possible for those who have eyes to see as the Quran says several times, that an idea of its underlying principles and profound meaning may be glimpsed. Knowledge may arise through beauty, if you like. This is one of my favorite um, Islamic gardens in Morocco. It's called the al Bafa Garden in Fez. The world continues to need good ambassadors for Islam. And what better ambassador could there be than beauty? I would add the beauty of a garden in particular, since its natural ingredients are trees, flowers, plants, and water. And people do not usually argue about these. Therefore, a garden may break down barriers in a less challenging way than formal art and architecture. And beautiful Islamic gardens can be made pretty well all over the world, providing we respect the local topographical conditions and climate and select plants accordingly, which of course, I believe you've done at Antama. Another effective tool in building bridges, more, much more powerful than interfaith dialogue, is to involve the local community when creating the garden. Such collaboration may have a tremendously integrating effect. This small Islamic garden I designed for the new mosque in Cambridge, England, it opened in 2019, it helped tremendously in placating the nervous neighbors, nervous about the new mosque in their midst. Not only does it now provide much needed green respite on a busy, noisy road, but also the nearby gardening community were involved from the beginning and volunteered to help. So just to return for a moment to the theme of sacred art and the importance of beauty, we must attempt very briefly to answer the question of what is sacred art? This is something I discuss a lot with our students at the Prince's School in London. Very briefly, we could say that it's the presence of the celestial and beyond form within this realm of form, bringing a taste of the invisible, if you like, into the domain of the visible. But how is this achieved? I will attempt to sum the answer up. The artist needs to be completely dedicated and to learn from a master craftsman over a lifetime. He or she learns not only the technical and artistic skills required, but also, crucially, inward qualities such as discipline, patience and humility. After a time, such qualities may help dissolve our own egos and open us up to true inspiration. So that we become a kind of we become a kind of vehicle, um, empty for this inspiration. This is the Shah Mosque or Imam Mosque, as it's now called in Isfahan. Being such an artist is very demanding, and in the end, the primary attribute I would say for the practice of the arts of the sacred is love. <laughs> 
because without love you simply could not you, you could you would not have the the sort of commitment to carry on because it's it, extremely hard work if you've ever tried to do calligraphy for example i mean i've had students who spent a year in istanbul under one one um, a master teacher and you spend a year just doing one letter the alif and you go on and on you keep throwing them away it's just a taste of what it's like so without this love the artist craftsman would not be able to continue their work as one writer has put it Sacred art is heaven descended to earth, rather than earth reaching towards heaven. And I make no apology for showing the Taj again, because really clearly it would not have this effect if it were not placed at the head of a beautiful garden. In Islam, similar to Native American cosmology, everything in nature is transparent. A leaf or a flower is not simply what you perceive with your outer eye, but rather its beauty is a reflection or symbol of its hidden mysterious essence, which you may only approach with your inner eye, the eye of the heart. Socrates said that this inner eye is worth 10,000 outer eyes. And throughout the Quran, there's a refrain which says, everything in nature is a sign or a symbol of your Lord. Symbolic language is an essential element of all sacred art, since hand in hand with beauty, it leads us from the outer visible world to the inner invisible world. The word symbol, symbol, comes from the Greek meaning to throw together, as opposed to diabol or diabolic, which means to pull apart. Sacred art demands the sensitive and knowledgeable application of proportion, harmony, balance, rhythm and color. The aim being to exalt nature and capture her inner wisdom, rather than copying her limited outward form. This art points to hidden truths through the three main languages of Islamic art, geometry, calligraphy, and arabesque or Islimi. It results in a clear limpid beauty of calm repose, reflecting the unity of spirit that characterizes Islam. The center of the mosque, this is the, the one we're looking at here is in Lahore, the Jami Mosque, the main mosque. And this is one of my most favorite mosques. It's a beautiful mosque in, in, in Fez, again in Morocco, the Karawin Mosque. The center of the mosque, madrasa, which is a school or courtyard house or garden is the point from which everything radiates. The heart of each often being the fountain or pool it's open upwards towards the sky, the celestial realm, and is closed from the public sphere, the street, keeping the inner private and hidden, like paradise itself. So now to answer a question asked me many times, what is an Islamic garden? I start usually with what I call the three underlying principles, and then following on from them, there are several key elements. So the three underlying principles, number one is the concept that paradise is a garden is a very ancient one, predating all three Abrahamic religions by centuries, going back as far as the Sumerian period of 4000 BC. Uh, now this of course is not 4000 years old, but this is the oldest depiction I could find. So this is an ancient Egyptian garden with these key elements of water and trees. Now the second, after the, this idea of paradise being very ancient, is the oasis, the quintessential desert garden of fresh water and date palms. The origin, it could be said, of the paradise garden, since when you've been trekking across brown sand and rock for days on end, with the glare of the sun beating down, the sight of green palm trees and the sound of running water will indeed be your paradise. This is the Siwa oasis in north, north, northwestern Egypt. It's not surprising that an English woman wrote in the early 20th century, the spirit of the garden paradises of Europe hides in the flowers, the grass, the trees, but the soul of the Eastern Garden lies in none of these. It is centered on the running water, which alone makes its other beauties possible. 
finally, the third of these underlying principles, or the defining cause of the Islamic garden, the Quran, with its sublime descriptions of the Jannat al Fadus, the gardens of paradise. Jannah meaning garden and Firdos meaning paradise, infusing everything with a whole new spiritual and intellectual world vision. So after these, after these three principles come the key elements. Now number one of these key elements, and I'm sure you are all aware, is of course water, the supreme element of the Islamic paradise garden, both on a practical and symbolic level with green shade coming a close second. Indeed, of course, the shade is only made possible by the water. This, this fountain, as some of you may have seen, is one of the beautiful fountains in the Court of Myrtles at the Alhambra. And this is a shade um, in Delhi, next to, the, next to Humayun's tomb. Shade represents mercy as it gives such longed for relief, relief from the heat of the sun. In Arabic, there is a saying that green is cooling for the eyes. It is the color of spring, fertility and growth. And symbolically, it represents hope and renewal. And isn't it lovely now? Have you noticed? I don't know what it's like in New York and Yonkers, but we're just getting signs of spring now here in the UK. And I must say, after a difficult year, it really is, it really is wonderful. But it's no accident that in the descriptions of paradise in the Quran, the color green reigns supreme. For the pre-Islamic Arabs, these two, water and shade, were already indispensable for survival in the desert and already revered as sacred. So by the time the Quran was revealed in the seventh century with its promise of gardens of paradise to the faithful and righteous, it was perfectly natural for them to accept this. This is the court of the Linda Raha with its magnificent fountain and very tall cypress trees, one of the courtyards at the Alhambra. There are many references in the Quran to the fountains, flowing waters, shade giving trees and perfect temperate climate of paradise. The phrase most often used, which Steve mentioned earlier, is in Arabic, Jannat Tajri Min Al Anha, meaning gardens underneath which rivers flow. The idea of water flowing underneath possibly arose from the demands of a desert existence, where the only source of water for most of the year was from the oases or underground irrigation systems, such as the Kanats in Persia. In the gardens themselves, the water, this is a lovely garden, by the way, in Almeria um, in southern Andalusia, well worth a visit when you're able to travel to Spain. In the gardens themselves, the water is not usually underground, but in order to irrigate the trees and flower beds, it often flows in geometric channels, occasionally under the pathways, giving the visitor the impression of being in a garden underneath which rivers flow. Here, this is in Seville, the orange tree courtyard with its patterned patterned brick and narrow water channels, which are dry in the daytime, but then come alive at night or the early morning when the water is released for irrigation. Not only do you hear and feel the lovely sound and energy of running water, but the air is refreshed and your spirits are lifted. And water is, as everyone knows, vital for life on earth. And we humans are made up of around 72% water. It's used not only to cleanse ourselves of physical dirt, but also symbolically to wash away sins. In Christian baptism, the blessed water is believed to purify the soul of the devil. And in Islam, the ablutions before prayer symbolically cleanse the soul as well as the body. This is a, a, a lovely um, 12 lobed fountain in Isfahan in the Friday mosque. And this is back to the Alhambra, the Partal Palace, with this pool, still pool in front, front, with reflection. And profoundly, water is a reflection of the soul. It has an effect upon us. When it is calm, it calms us. If it is moving, it may energize us. We are usually drawn to water when walking around a garden. Have you noticed? We end up sitting by it, feeling content and contemplative. 
especially if it is a still clear pool, but also if it is a gentle fountain. This is another Alhambra fountain, one of my favorites with this. Just to continue a little bit on the, on the symbolism and use of water as it's, as it's so important. I mean, in the, in the United Kingdom, we're blessed with a temperate climate where the popular idea of paradise is a desert island with a palm tree. Perhaps also that's the case um, where you are in Yonkers or wherever you are. So we need to be Remind, we need to be reminded just how much water and shade means to those living in a desert climate. This is a riad from the roof of a house where I've designed a garden. And it's just a reminder that these of the dust and the dryness, and as you can see, very little green. It's a shock every year. I usually go back every year to um, oversee the garden. Um, and you know, and it just brings it home, this sort of longing for something soft on the eyes and, and the sound of water. And it, it makes it very clear why water is viewed as a blessing from heaven. So this is the courtyard within. Rain in particular is seen as a direct symbol of God's mercy and is described throughout the Quran as a mercy and as life-giving. And you can see this is like an oasis in the middle of the, um, the dusty, dry, brown city of Riyadh. However, I just to add on a practical note, designers, and there may be some designers um, seeing this or hearing this, we need to assess the water very carefully when, you, when designing an Islamic garden in the Northern Hemisphere. Because really the last thing you want is a cold splash of water on a freezing cold day. This is um, the Prince of Wales's garden at Highgrove, which is in the country about two hours from London. And he calls it, it was, it's called the carpet garden. And it was made about 20 years ago originally for the Chelsea Flower Show. And I was the assistant designer on this. And then it was moved from Chelsea Flower Show to, to Highgrove in Gloucestershire. And um, this central fountain, it was it's called the carpet garden because he, he, he sort of saw two of his carpets and he decided he wanted to make a garden out of them. And I expect, as many of you know, there's quite a tradition of what are called garden carpets. So people in Iran and Anatolia wove carpets, which are pictures of gardens, if you like, to bring the garden inside during the winter. The Prince of Wales kind of reversed this and took his carpets outside, as it were. So this central fountain um, is packed up in the winter. You can see it closer here. It was made in um, either Spain or Morocco. The tiles, as you can see, were actually made in Morocco. And it has to be packed up, not just turned off. Um, it's packed up in, in, in straw, I think, and sacking, because otherwise the tiles crack. Water in a traditional Islamic garden is almost always formal. That is in straight lines, as you see here. This, this is at the Seville Kasaba. It's and also never ostentatious. Fountain, fountains should murmur. They should be quiet and gentle and not boiling cascades, as Russell Page um, complained about in his marvelous book, Education of a Gardener. There's a constant interplay between movement and stillness that both soothes and mirrors the soul. And this is in the Henra Lifei. So varieties of this playfulness with water can may be seen across the Islamic world. And it's been suggested that the fountain in a hot country is equivalent in importance to the open fire in a fireplace in a cold country. In terms, of both practical use and symbolic significance, just as the fountain is a living grace, as it were, at the heart of the courtyard house or the garden or mosque, the fire for those li who live in a cold climate, and I think it gets very cold in Yonkers, Jessica told me in the winter, it brings not only much needed warmth, but also essential cheer and homeliness. It's no accident that heart and hearth are etymologically connected. In the Islamic garden, the water of the fountain should always be brimful to overflowing, as it represents the eternally flowing waters of paradise. Now, 
Now to move on to the third element after water and shade. This is the garden's geometric fourfold design. Partly deriving from the ancient Persian prototype, which itself was based upon the universal optimum method of irrigation. So you do find this fourfold the form in a sense all over the world it, because it's the best way it goes to the four di cardinal directions of space and here's the untamar from above you can see how unlike i have to say many gardens in the islamic world your water is 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 working beautifully but crucially this also this fourfold form refers back to the descriptions in the quran mainly in chapter 55, Surat al-Rahman, which is the chapter of the All-Merciful, in which four gardens or two pairs of gardens, one lower pair and one higher, are described. These four gardens have come to be represented by the Chaharbag, which literally means four gardens in Persian. It is recognized as the quintessential Islamic garden the world over and has countless different expressions, not least here at the magnificent Untamaya Gardens, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But very sadly, I am not. But inshallah, one day I will visit. And I know, as Steve has reminded us, this is called the Persian Garden. It's important to remember that all fourfold Islamic gardens on earth are inspired by these four gardens of the Quran I've just mentioned. It is these that provide the underlying meaning and motivation. Not only are they representations of the heavenly gardens, but they offer the visitor, who has an open mind and heart, a foretaste of them. And here, a closer up of, your, of the four rivers, representing the four rivers of paradise, which we go on to, and the central fountain. So each of the four gardens has its own, has its own fountain. and its own river and its own particular fruit. The rivers are one of water, one of milk, one of honey and one of wine. The, fruit, the, the four main fruit bearing trees are the date, the olive, the fig and the pomegranate. This is a, a Mughal miniature painting, I think 17th century. The fact that the Islamic garden is founded upon a heavenly garden and is therefore a reminder of our link with the divine, whether or not we are conscious of it, is perhaps a reason why such gardens may offer more in the way of solace from the challenges of living in the world today. This is one of my favorite gardens actually, it's called the Sultana Garden, which is in the Henralife, just above the famous Patio de la Asecchia. I don't know if any of you have been there. You can see, you can just see on the left-hand side, the cypress tree behind which the Sultana was supposed to meet her lover. And when they found out, of course, um, the lover and his whole family were put to death. But still, we want to concentrate on the lovely water and the green. Um, this is the Albatha fountain. I showed the whole garden earlier. Quite often in Islamic gardens, and I think we've seen others too, you instead of the four rivers, which are very or four or four channels of water, which are very difficult to maintain, um, there are four paths with a central fountain. And it's these pathways which create the fourfold design. I mean, here it seems they can't even keep the water in the fountain going. But you can also see the beginnings here of something we'll talk about a little bit in a while. It's the balance between rigor, which is the geometry, and the abundance of the planting. Or the, the in Islamic art, it's the geometry and, and, the, and the arabesque or esteemly. The point to emphasize is that this fourfold form, far from being exclusively Islamic, is completely universal. And it's been adapted to construct gardens all over the world. This is in England. This is in Wales in the West Country. And you, I hope you can see that actually there are four of these gardens enclosed with a box with some lovely um, informal and lush planting. And quite very wisely, they don't have a central fountain because it's in the West Country and there's a lot of rain there. So they have this central, what probably used to be a fountain, but is now planted. 
but this is something which one aims for. It's quite an English thing as well, this balance between geometry and informality. The, in fact, one because the art of medieval Christian Europe has a similar outlook as traditional Islamic art. This is Salisbury Cathedral, one of the great cathedrals in England. Um, and the cloister, you see, which is, um, again, it's fourfold, looking inwards and upwards, just like a mosque, and it, towards the heart and towards heaven. And this is paralleled in the great colleges of Oxford and Cambridge, as we see here, Christchurch, Oxford, again, divided into four with the central fountain. The great Victorian wall gardens, and this is um, the one at Highgrove, are also divided into four. Again, this balance between, well, we can see it better here, actually, at Sissinghurst, very famous garden in England, which I'm sure some of you visited. And you get this balance again between the geometry or the, the formality and the abundant planting. So there's a lot of similarities, which one may not, not, may, may not initially have thought about. This is a contemporary, well, it was made about 10 years ago, maybe, in Ibiza. Um, and as you can see, the, the fourfold form is, is in um, paths, and they planted a lot of, I think it's actually the lavender, and I think there's thyme, so you get the scent, which we come on to. But the important quality that distinguished an Islamic Chaharbag, as we see here, from other fourfold gardens, is not only that it's based on the descriptions of the Quran, and thus there exists a sacred intention, as it were, and the intention is very important in Islam. But also throughout the Quran, it is written, and I mentioned this before actually, everything in nature is a sign or symbol of God. This reinforces our consciousness of the sanctity of the natural world which I'm sure any of you who are gardens are very aware of already. More than ever in our technology dominated lives, we are encouraged to be in nature for our own well-being, not to say sanity, in order to connect with the truly living instead of the virtual living of the computer screen. Exactly what we're doing now. But since the Chahar Bagh is a mirror of the eternal paradise garden, as well as being a foretaste of it, it may perhaps have more potential than other gardens to remind us that life is short and that nature is a living whole penetrated by the spirit. The next, the fourth element is enclosure, which you can see very clearly here in this small um, walled garden in Fez again, this traditional city in Morocco. And of course the word paradise actually means enclosed by walls. from the Persian Paradesa. Parad These were the huge hunting parks they had, which were enclosed by walls in ancient Persia. So we have this idea of seclusion, an area isolated from its surroundings to create and protect, a place of fertility and ease within. It's a kind of sanctuary for contemplation. And I just want to show the walls of your garden, the Untermeyer garden. Now, although, of course, outside you've got a, you've got green lawn, which is lovely. Um, of course, in an Islamic garden or other gardens, you, you usually there's usually the wall is there to keep out the desert or to keep out the city. But always there's this lovely mystery about a wall. And I think this is the idea of paradise being hidden and secret and mysterious. What and you sort of want to penetrate what is behind. I'm sure many of you have read the, the lovely children's book, um, The Secret Garden. It's very much um, very similar to what we're talking about here, the sort of magical paradise garden within. So now we come to the fifth element, um, which is the, the harmonious interweaving of architecture with the garden. I mean, you get this in other gardening traditions, but I would say that it's um, par excellence, the Islamic tradition um, excels. This is the Sultana garden again, uh, with its beautiful above and below sort of loggia. This idea of being able to easily move from the out into the in, into shade. And the, these, this is a, in, in a garden, but you, could, you also, a small house, a palace, 
or indeed a mausoleum. Now we've already seen the Taj Mahal at the head of a garden. Um, and this is Humayun's tomb, which is in the center of the garden in Delhi. It's a particular thing of, of the Mughal tradition, the Mughal um, culture of these um, magnificent mausoleum gardens. And this, this close link between architecture and the landscape or the surrounding planting. The next two elements, the sixth and seventh, are flowers and scent. Flowers offering a beautiful array of colours and textures, as well as a wide variety of perfume. The word, Arabic word rehan mentioned in the Quran literally translates as basil, but is more often referred to as sweet scented herbs. And it's well known how strong fragrances are a major feature of daily life in the Muslim world in particular. The eighth element, and perhaps the most important, is the sense of unity that underlies the order, balance and correct proportion in the garden. This unity does not arise from an amalgamation of individual elements gathered together superficially, which you might say is what I've been doing, but I hope that I've emphasized the, 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 the sort of sacred intention, as it were. Um, so it does not arise from just you know, plucking these elements from all over the place and putting them together, but is really the expression of a pre-existing order and harmony that is the central message of the Quran. This is divine unity which penetrates all of existence. It's ultimately, I'd say, this principle that gives an Islamic garden its particular serene beauty. The great writer on, on Islamic art of the 20th century, Titus Burkhardt, articulates clearly Islamic, to quote, Islamic art is essentially the projection into the visual order of certain aspects of divine unity. Again, this is at the Alhambra, as you come out of the series of palaces, and this is, we're looking above down to the Partal Palace, one of the older ones, with the pool in front. And it's an extraordinary thing about the Alhambra and the Henralife. Really, the, the planting is not that wonderful. I don't know if any of you, again, I hope some of you have been there, but there is something about the proportion and the harmony and the, the this harmonious interweaving of the architecture, the water, the shrubs, the trees. You have to have height. It's very important, this height as well as the shrubs. You know, it really does speak to you of something, something above and beyond. Now, there's one final ingredient of the Islamic Paradise Garden. What is this? Well, I said at the beginning of my talk, assalamu alaikum, which means peace be upon you. Well, the only word spoken in paradise is salam, which means peace. How wonderful is this? But is it peace from our own, is it peace from the world or is it peace from our own chattering minds? The great Jalal Adin Rumi wrote that the real gardens and flowers are within, they're in man's heart, not outside. Just as the external garden needs constant attention to prevent weeds taking root and disease thriving, so does the internal garden, the contemplative soul. In Sufism, as Steve mentioned at the very beginning, the inner aspect, of, which is the inner aspect of Islam, the internal garden is nurtured through prayer and through the remembrance of God. As this planet we live on becomes increasingly urbanized, over 80% live in towns now, there is a greater desire, I'm sure all of you have experienced this, particularly in the last year, to escape the noise and pollution of the huge cities we've become masters at creating. There's no doubt that spending time in nature or in a public park or garden helps to soothe our soul. For the purposes of both soothing the soul and of bridge building, we could propose an Islamic garden. It would offer not only a more conscious taste of the invisible sacred presence, but also a subtle and uplifting educational opportunity, a place to open the visitor's heart and mind. This is some of our uh, planting at the Cambridge Mosque in England. 
It's interesting to note too that the Islamic garden lends itself well to a small back garden in a city since it represents a refuge or a sanctuary, not from the desert as I said before, but from the pandemonium of daily city life. This is a little garden in Hampstead with tulips, um, one of the key flowers. Of course, we don't have time to talk about individual plants, flowers and trees, apart from the four main ones I mentioned, but of course the tulip comes from Turkey and um, I always like to plant these lily flower tulips which have pointed petals because you often see them in miniature paintings. And this is a small, very small garden in Paris. The Islamic garden is a powerful symbol for drawing peoples together, not only because of its associations with paradise, but also because its prime, prime materials, as it were, are plants, trees and flowers, which by their nature speak of tranquility and peace. Very near the end. This is back to the carpet garden again at Highgrove. Um, so is it possible or desirable to make a traditional Islamic garden in a different culture and climate to those in which it was born? And I would say definitely yes, but with clear qualifications. You need to provide careful attention to local planting condition, as I'm, of course you've done at Untermeyer and you know well, you have your Persian garden with the water and the fourfold design, but you plant um, trees and shrubs and flowers, which obviously thrive there. You haven't um, been tempted to plant a date palm, which unfortunately some people do, even though it's obviously far too cold. Now these 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 are just two um, sort of fourfold gardens in London at Clarence House. This is where the Prince of Wales lives, and it's a small garden you can see, but it you know it works very well. You've got um, a lot of lavender for scent. You've got your fourfold form, and then the centre very wisely he doesn't have a fountain actually. He's got the sun a sun dial. Of course we don't have that much sun but in any case it's of course much less maintenance and in this, this is the same garden you can see they've planted ro roses are very um no not exactly sacred in islam but um, as here in in the uk and possibly in america it's the the most sort of beloved of plants of, of flowers let's say So this is the last slide, this is back to the Cambridge Mosque. Um, for designers like myself, the beauty and intimacy of the traditional Islamic garden, particularly the ones of the, all the different gardens at the Alhambra and Henralife, and we've seen quite a few of them this afternoon. They're a huge source of inspiration in creating gardens today. Here in Cambridge, we had the wonderful opportunity of creating a marriage between East and West, if you like as is the new mosque itself. You can just glimpse some of the arches behind. Such gardens, we hope, inshallah, God willing, have the potential to become symbols of unity, hope and sustainability in an increasingly fragmented and secular world. Thank you, Steve and Jessica. That's, that's the end. I, I'm not sure how, I hope that wasn't too long. Um, so Emma, we, we have two questions for you today. Um, Very good. One, is, one is from Marie Helen Atwood, and she's talking about, um, I was told the Islamic garden and its ancestor, the Persian garden, are urban encoding of the agrarian knowledge humans learned from civilization. Do you Sorry. agree? I, you know, you're going to have to repeat. I didn't, I missed, I missed a word there. You said I, I have that the Islamic Sorry. garden and its ancestor, the Persian garden, are mm. urban encoding of the agrarian uh, knowledge. Urban. Sorry, I didn't, urban what? It goes blank. Urban encoding. Encoding? Of agrarian knowledge humans learned from civilization. Do you agree? Um, I don't know. I don't really use that term encoding, so I'm not absolutely sure. Does she mean a kind of interpretation? I mean, certainly, um, you know the Chahara Bagh and the smaller gardens and, and you know I have just mostly been looking at the Chahara Bagh um, 
is a kind of interpretation of something that was bigger. I mean, that you know, I don't know about the agrarian. Then she said agrarian. I don't know. I would say it needs discussion because I'm not really clear of, you know, what urban encoding means. I mean, I believe she means she is brought from the rural agrarian into the city. Um, I mean, it certainly does that. And as I said, it lends itself very, very well to that. Um, because you can make them, you know, you, they're, they're extremely adaptable. But you can also make very large ones. Um, and actually, you know, something I haven't touched upon, because we really haven't had time, this idea of the agrarian, because if you read the Quran, there's so much about food, you know, growing, the plants that are mentioned are all really about growing for food and fruit, all the fruit trees. So, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I would say, yes, up to a point, but I wouldn't put it like that. I find that I, I'm not, you know, because I'm not very familiar with that kind of language, but there's certainly some truth in that, is all as far as I could say. And there's, you know, as I say, there's an awful lot about um, in the original gardens, as it were, that is to be eaten. It's very practical, just as all the gardens were in the, in the um, monasteries, actually. That's I mean, true. now we... You know, things are separated now, like, as I mentioned, the Victorian kitchen garden. I think, in a sense, we're sort of coming back to the idea of mixing things up, you know, and, you know, and saying that there's great beauty in, in growing vegetables and fruit. Well, I think there's, we've always understood that fruit trees are beautiful because in blossom, they're beautiful. These are blossoming crab apple trees. Um, so I think it's an interesting, it's interesting and definitely, yeah, there is definitely some truth in that. So your next question, and I would like to formally apologize for perhaps pronouncing this name incorrectly, from Golnar Racy Sadegi or Sadech, uh, which is what is the significance of four in garden design? Well, All it's huge. Trahar Bag, etc. It's hugely significant. Again, I had to cut. You know, I had to cut out an awful lot. I mean, number four. I, you know, there's a huge um, amount of symbolism in the whole of the four gardens. It's very sort of esoteric. But four itself is the number of earth. So you have the four cardinal directions, the four major winds, the four seasons. Everything to do with num four is to do with earth. And the circle is usually together with the circle. The circle is heaven. And I actually, in another talk I give, I usually show a slide of the Kaaba. And the Kaaba, of course, is where Muslims turn towards during prayer. But the Kaaba itself is a huge, I mean, people talk about it being a huge black cube because it's covered in a black cloth, which has got woven in gold. It's got um, verses from the Quran, but it looks like a, it's a, a black, it's a vast black cube and round it in a circle people circumambulate so you which means going round in a circle seven you go seven times when you make um pilgrimage or you pray and i in fact the slide i have is actually they're all praying to to you know there are several layers of worshippers praying in circles around the central cube, which is fourfold, which where it's four. So it's it's a, like a meeting place between heaven and earth, if you like. So number four definitely is, it just speaks to us of, 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 of the earth. I mean, every single number has a, has a symbolism. Three is, as it were, the number of harmony, one could say. I mean, it's a lot more. Number two, two is division of one. One, of course, is unity, divine unity. Four is earth. Five is usually man because or well, mankind, humankind. When we stand, we have five. And number six is creation. I mean, that's enough for the moment, I think, because one could go on a very long time about numbers, the symbolism of number. But um, I think that's one of the reasons. Well, it's four because it's it's from the Quran, and all of all of that symbolism um, is in Surat Al Rahman. You know, as, as I think it was Rumi who said, there are seven layers of symbolism, meaning in the Quran, and only four are known to man, humankind. So the next question is from Susan Hess, um, and she wants to know, many of these gardens originated in desert societies, but do you have any suggestions for using these principles in a shade garden? Well, yes, that's why I, I said, well, one of the things was to be careful about using water. Um, 
I think you you could, of course, it depends how much shade, but you, yes, you just use the right plants. And I mean, I'm sure you're I mean, I'm constantly being asked questions about what can you plant in wet shade, dry shade, you know, whether you can, you can um, lift the branches on the trees if it's trees that's providing the shade. Quite often, of course, in an urban situation, it's going to be a wall. But you can do, if you've got enough room, it's quite nice to have um, a central, either just a, you could have a bowl of water for the birds, which is what I've got, just because I love watching the birds. And then you can just put four, you know, like slabs, uh, I think in the Ibiza garden, he's just done sort of slabs of stone. And you you could do, go out in a fourfold design and then you just plant accordingly. You know, you can just put vinca in or, you know, it depends on your situation. But yes, that's what I said. I really do think. I mean, it's the it's the the sort of the geometric form which can be interpreted in just a countless number of ways, and and you know, it's rather nice to do it with um, shade loving plants as opposed to sun loving plants. Um, we certainly had to do that in the in the garden in Paris because that had very little light. So yes, is the answer. <laughs> All right, the, our last question. Um, Robert Palmer asks, you mentioned Persian, Islamic, and Arabic gardens. How do you distinguish between these categories? Or do um, you? <laughs> well, yes, you can. As I said, I mean, Islamic are extraordinary. I mean, it's quite an interesting thing. Up until the 20th century, nobody really talked about Islamic art or Islamic gardens. And in fact, even recently, I remember somebody at the British Mu Museum saying there's no such thing as Islamic garden. And, um, you know, there's only Persian garden, Moroccan garden, Arab garden, wh wherever you are. However, as I pointed out, and I would emphasize, you know, the central message of the Quran is divine unity. And it's extraordinary. And I expect, I don't know if Robert Palmer, is his name if if he's traveled in the muslim world but i mean if you go to turkey and you see the mosques there they are i mean they're magnificent but they're completely different from the mosques in morocco which again are completely different from the mosques in egypt say or in iran and we looked at one of them the shah mosque however and you could talk about Persian, yes you could talk about Persian mosques, but i would always call it I mean, now everyone knows about the Islamic world. As they, in, a, in a way, didn't. There is this unity of spirit which underlies all of them, but they flower in particular ways. So this is what we mean by the universal, the universal in particular. Um, I don't think I actually said Arabic garden because I don't. On the whole, I mean. You know, it is in a sense, it is the oasis, it all goes back to the oasis. And certain of these countries excel in gardens. And in particular, I would say Mughal India and Iran or, ancient, or Persia. Um, Turkish gardens are much more European, I think partly because of the proximity to Europe, just as slightly different. Um, Morocco has, you know, the Albatha Gar Gardens, and then look at Andalusia, which is, you know, these um, extraordinary Alhambra and Henralife. It's very, it's in very interesting sort of mixture there because you, you know, it was for 800 years it was Muslim in Granada, and now for the maybe 600 years, well, I can't count, but from 1453, the final um, collapse of the Muslim Empire, but in Granada. So since then, it's been under well, Christian Europe rule. So it's, it, there's a rather beautiful mix there. Um, so it's a bit of both. I mean, I hope you, I hope, I, I mean, I hope that you got something from my slightly garbled answer there. But there definitely is, I mean, it is the extraordinary thing, I think, about the Islamic world. You have this unity of spirit which flowers in this multiplicity of ways. Okay, thank you so much for an amazing talk. I've learned so much. Um, <laughs> thank and you, Jessica. Oh, my voice thank is good. everyone for coming and putting up with our slight technical difficulties at the beginning. We really appreciate your patience. It must be odd not hearing and not seeing. Well, she's not that odd not seeing someone. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you, Jessica. Well done for getting the slides going.
it's very odd not being able to see or hear people, I must say. So I hope you haven't all gone to sleep. You've probably all gone to make a cup of coffee or something. In any case, I hope you enjoyed looking at the slides. And thank you, Steve, as well. All right.